afternoon, good morning, whatever time you're choosing to watch this close read and read along with me. I'm really excited you're here today, scholars. My name is Miss Green, and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Uplift Meridian. I'm really excited to get to do the close read with you guys today because at this point in the year, you've learned everything from your teachers. You've spent weeks learning new skills, practicing those skills, and honing in on what it looks like to be a fifth grade scholar. Um, so as you only have a couple more weeks left in fourth grade, today we are going to spend our time talking about what great readers do when they read texts and also practicing some attack strategies that we use at Meridian that I hope that you can bring to your school and show off to your fifth grade teacher next year. So we're on lesson five, pages 97 to 101, and we are going to practice those things and then hopefully you can send it to your teacher to show them what you've learned this week. So I'm going to be going back and forth, not too many times, between this and my dot cam so you can see how I attack the text. You'll be working alongside me as I ask, ask some questions and show you how I would attack the text if I was a fourth grader. So let's go ahead and check out what we're reading today. This text is called Learning in a One Room School. Now we know as great readers and as you guys have been doing all year, before we read a text, we're going to preview the text. That looks like looking at the text features, um, determining the genre, and therefore determining our thinking job today. So if I look at these text features, the two biggest ones that I'm seeing right now are the title, learning in a one room school, and these three pictures that you have to the side. So take five seconds right now just from looking at the pictures to determine what you think the genre might be. And if you took that sweet guess that I know all of you did today, it is nonfiction, you are correct. So when we know that a text is a nonfiction text, we have one very big thinking job that we as readers have used almost every single time. It'll help narrow it down once we determine the topic, but our thinking job today is, what is the author teaching me about the topic. Okay, what is the author teaching me about the topic? And I write it at the top just to remind myself as I read. Most times, but not always, you're going to see the topic somewhere in your title. So when we look at the title, it says learning in a one room school. I'm going to hope that within these first couple paragraphs, I'll be able to figure out it's what we're learning about and what a one room school is. So for now, I'm gonna leave it as, what is the author teaching me about the topic? Assuming that is going to be a one room school. Okay. Um, and if we scan the text and we flip through, it's a couple pages today. We'll notice that this is technically a paired passage. So you not only have your passage titled learning in a one room school, but you are also going to see this letter from a teacher. OK, and so before we get to the questions, we're going to attack both of these together. So at Meridian, we use some pretty sweet passage attack, a plan of attack strategies. And you see here we've previewed the passage. So we scan the text and quickly jot the genre and the thinking job down. Second, we are going to read closely and carefully. I'm going to read it with you guys today. Obviously, we're not in person and we're going to talk through what the author is teaching us in each paragraph. And finally, stamp the thinking job. Since this is a nonfiction text, at the end, we're going to add a main idea and talk about what we thought as readers was the purpose of this whole text. Let's go ahead and get started. All right. Children 100 years ago went to school every day like you do, but their school was much smaller. In fact, it only had one room. In the 1800s and early 1900s, very long time ago, many people in the United States settled in rural communities in the West. So that is a great word that's going to tell us not only do we know it's in the 18 and 1900s, like a long time ago, but it's in rural communities. So I'm going to hop back over right now to that PowerPoint, and we're going to talk about that word rural. Rural. Everyone say rural. It's a hard word. All right, so basically that means a farming or an agricultural area. The reason I chose to give you guys this word is because it helps your understanding of why the one 
room schoolhouse is how it is. Not only was it one to 200 years ago, but it was in a town like this where you see roads, if you've ever driven through East Texas, miles where you might only see one or two houses. And so it's spread out and it was a long time ago. So it explains why this schoolhouse is not like the schools that you attend through Uplift. So we'll bounce back over and we're actually gonna write down in context what that word rural means. And I just, I'm gonna quickly just write farm town. That'll help us later when we're answering some questions. All right, not many people lived in these communities, but those who did wanted their children to receive an education. So people built a schoolhouse in the center of their community. So I'm learning that these are often in the center of a whole community. This way, all the children within the community could walk to school. We don't really have that at Meridian. Most of us drive. Some people walk or take a bus. This was still a far journey for some students. However, it was not uncommon for students to have to walk two miles to get to school. So in a nonfiction text, I'm going to do a quick stop and jot. I'm going to think, what did the author teach me about the topic? And I just quickly, as my shorthand is I'm going to write ATM on the side. The author teaches me. And I'm going to say that I just learned that they are in small towns with only one school. Now, you'll notice I didn't write a lot right there. And that's just because this is to remind you as a reader when you go back to answer the questions, what information is in that paragraph? All right, let's keep going. One room schoolhouses had only one teacher who taught students in grades one through eight. You guys, only one teacher who taught students in grades one through eight. Now, we know it's in a small town, so it's not as big as your school, but it is people from all ages. So you might have five-year-olds and you might have 14-year-olds in one room with one teacher. Most families back then had many children, and these children may all be in the same room, one room school, and their teacher might be the, their older sister or brother. Teachers were often very young and former students themselves. Some teachers boarded or stayed with local families. There's one thing that the author did right here. When it says some teachers boarded, the author actually gives you the definitions. That means they lived with the local families. So could you imagine your teacher living with your family so that they could walk to school with you? Some kids might love it. My kids would just assume we'd read all night. So we see here, we're gonna go with another ATM and we're gonna ask ourselves, what did the author teach me about the topic, one room schools, okay? And I wrote that it had, what I learned when I was going is that it has one teacher and scholars at all grades. I cannot imagine. So I actually put on the PowerPoint for you guys another example of some clear pictures of what you actually see in your close read. So this is kind of on the right. Now many of you may have read the book Holes or seen the movie and when it flashes back in time that's actually talking about a one-room schoolhouse. So that's what you see here is actually the picture of the house or the school from Holes. And you'll see here on the side, kids of many ages sitting in a classroom. Now this picture on the upper right, that's probably as we're getting closer to the 1900s, right? A little older, maybe our grandparents' time. But this one down here where you see kids um, often smushed in the seats, you have a heater in the middle of the classroom. That's what we're gonna learn about in the next couple paragraphs. All right, like classrooms today, the teacher's desk in one room was in the I'm so sorry, I'm shifting that. The teacher's desk in one room school was in the front of the room, and students usually sat in desk built for two. So that's what you saw in the picture. I'm gonna underline that. Students usually sat in desk built for two. And that is not uncommon in many countries outside of the United States, actually. Often when you see low income, which means not a lot of money. Um, places, you will see a lot more kids shoved into smaller seating arrangements. An older student sat at a desk with a younger student. 
When the teacher was not working with them, the older student taught the younger student. So that would be like if you guys had kindergartners in your class, and when your teacher was no longer teaching you, you would go read to the kindergartner and help them learn the materials. This arrangement helped both students. The younger student learned new material, and the older student, flip the page, developed a better grasp on the material he or she learned years ago. The teacher worked with groups of students throughout the day. Very, very common, I imagine, to how small groups work in your class or guided reading groups. For example, a teacher might work with a fourth grade spelling student for 15 minutes, then the teacher might work with fifth grade history students for the next 15 minutes. So we finished a paragraph, and now, I'm sure you know by now, we're going to ask ourselves, what did the author teach me about the topic, which was one room schools, okay? And this paragraph is a little bigger, but again, it can be very simple. I put, it was a community of learners. So they work together and they're pursuing their learning together as a community. All right, let's keep going. One room schools lacked modern conveniences. Hmm. As a fourth grade scholar, I might ask myself, what is a modern convenience? So before I give that to you, we're going to keep reading to see if the author gives us context clues to define modern conveniences. Okay? They did not have electricity or indoor plumbing. Hmm. Those are things that we have in modern time, meaning now. The teachers and students burned wood in a stove in the center of the room for heat. Much like you saw in that picture. It's like having the heater in the very center. It's not coming from vents. Those who sat near the stove were often too warm, and those who sat far away were, from it were too cold. Water came from an outdoor well. They don't have water fountains. They have to go out there. An older boy had the job of filling a large pail with water from the well and hauling it back to the school. He placed the pail in the back of the room. Thirsty students would dip their cup in the pail and drink. Bathrooms were also outside. Children carried their lunches to school each day in a pail. Children played outside during recess, but they did not have playground equipment. So, back to this first question we asked ourselves, what is a modern convenience? So it lists it. Modern conveniences, if they did not have them, these are the things they did not have. Electricity, indoor plumbing, they didn't have a heater in the roof, right? It was in the center of the room. They didn't have running water. They didn't have bathrooms. They didn't have playground equipment. So when I tell myself what a modern convenience is, I'm often, I think I'm going to decide as a great reader that a modern convenience is something that nowadays we have to help make our lives easier. Okay? It's like a function or something that helps makes our lives easier or more convenient conveniences, convenient, you see those words are very similar, okay? So my ATM, this is a big paragraph, we learned a lot about one house, one room schoolhouses, and so I'm just writing here on the side, schoolhouses did not 